Um, welcome everyone to our uh, Becton Fellowship uh, talk um, this semester. Um, it's happy to have Jeff Hoffman joining us. Um, before I introduce Jeff, I want to just remind people about the Becton Fellowship. It was a program established at the School of Management in 1980 by Becton Dickinson and Company, a leading global medical instruments supplier in honor of Henry Becton, class of 37, um, and who was company chairman from 1961 to 1987. And the purpose of this fellowship is to bring practitioners from private and public institutions to share the professional insights with faculty and students. And uh, there's a no greater example of someone, a practitioner that has a lot to share than uh, Jeff Hoffman, uh, who's an accomplished entrepreneur and innovator in the fields of internet, e-commerce and entertainment and an all around nice guy. Uh, he launched his first software company while still a student here at Yale University. And over the years has founded and grown a series of successful startup companies guiding them to acquisitions and public offerings. He's been a pioneer and leader in e-commerce having founded and led companies in the Priceline.com uh, family of companies and has been CEO of Enable Holdings, a publicly traded company that operates online sites like ubit.com and redtag.com, which many of us have used. His creative juices have spilled into the entertainment industry uh, where he leads an independent film and music production company, Black Sky Entertainment. And Jeff has a lot of wisdom to offer entrepreneurs and has become a mentor to many as chairman of the Global Entrepreneurship Network, which works in 180 countries, as well as through his efforts in the Unreasonable Group, of which he is a founding board member and supports the scaling of growth stage entrepreneurs who are working on problems of major societal importance. I can give an example. A very close friend of mine is a top scientist at a fusion uh, nuclear fusion company that I think is supported by uh, Unreasonable Group. I know this from your website. And uh, so I could say much, much more about Jeff's past, but I know he's a forward looking person and is probably already getting bored hearing about all of this. So I want to shift to welcoming him back home to Yale and for them sure will be an inspiring talk and what we hope will be the start of many exciting future collaborations with Yale and SOF. So please, Jeff, take it away. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And you were right. I would have been fine with, hi, this is Jeff. Uh, yeah. Not a big intro person, but thanks anyway. I am going to immediately share my screen so that we can just jump right into this. Um, I have a there we go. Uh, can you guys see that all right, Eddie? See, everybody can see the screen. So this is uh, what I want to talk about today. Um, and by the way, it's nice to see many, so many friends uh, from the Yale community. I see Rodolfo there and Chuck and Tony and so many people that is an absolute pleasure to be in network with. Uh, when I interview prospective Yale students, which I still do every year, one of the first things I tell them is that the power of the network is just unbelievably strong. So let's talk about this. We're going to talk about innovation and inspiring it. And part of the reason is that companies, I, I visit companies all over the world now, and I literally have had the experience, even in some major corporations, of having somebody say, show me, the, hand me their business card, and it says chief innovation officer. And I say to them, what exactly does that mean? And they say, I don't know, the shareholders want us to have that on a business card somewhere. Innovation is this, uh, is this thing that they click. In, fa in fact, one of my favorite uh, sort of examples of, of the misunderstanding of what innovation is really about, because what I'm gonna give you today is three actionable techniques, things you can actually do to inspire more innovation. But it was a, a TV commercial at the time and a guy comes back from lunch, he's walking down the hall in his office and he can't find any of his teammates. And when he gets down to the conference room at the end, well, they certainly can't be in there um, because it's dark. But here's the sound and he turns around and all his teammates are in the conference room. They're laying on mats on the floor with the lights off quietly. And he said, what are you guys doing? And one of them says, we're innovating. And he says, wait a minute, how does that work? And he says, we just lay here and hope that somebody comes up with a good idea. 
And he said, how is this supposed to make our company more profitable? And there's a long silence. And then the guy says, well, we haven't innovated that yet. Um, a lot of people think that innovation is happens in the shower when you suddenly get an idea and it just pops up. But the truth is the world's most innovative people and companies literally do things to improve the, the chances of, of them being innovative and coming up with new ideas and et cetera. And I was really thinking about it one day uh, when, a, when a, a friend of mine who was an athlete, I hate to use this name in New England, um, but uh, unfortunately I was on the phone with uh, Derek Jeter when Derek was playing for the Yankees and we finished a call and Derek said, I gotta go, I have to go to practice. And I was like, wait a minute, you practice? And when I thought about it, I said, you're already literally the best baseball player in the world. Uh, why do you go to practice every day? And then I started thinking about that. And, and then I said to him, that's okay, me too. And he laughed and I said, what? And I said, I gotta practice too. And he said, you don't practice. And I said, actually I do. So the things I'm gonna share with you today are my equivalent of a baseball player going to practice. These are things that we do to improve our game and our game especially in the entrepreneurial world, but also for major corporates, academics, and government, is to continue to innovate and continue to come up with new ideas and better ways to do things. So that's what we're here for today. So let me go to this talk. And let me tell you this. I got on this journey. Um, and by the way, in reality, it started a little bit for me while I was at Yale because I had a hero there, which was the president at the time, Bart Giamatti. Um, not only was a hero, but he became a good friend. And I funded my Yale education. I couldn't afford to go. And I was basically being sent home by the Burzars office. And uh, I started a company, a little software company on campus. And uh, President Giamatti called me into his office one day to say, what exactly are you doing? And I said, I'm just trying to get a Yale degree. And he wound up becoming, like I said, not only a friend, but the way that he managed everything he did uh, I was fascinated by the guy. And this question that's on the screen, I started wondering, and throughout my life, what are the world's most innovative people and companies doing that everyone else isn't? There are some people that just keep getting a lot of things right, amazing ideas that you say to yourself, why didn't I think of that? And the answer is uh, because they go to practice every day and their odds of doing things, the way, uh, of coming up with the, uh, these ideas are greater than everybody else's because the techniques they employ to open their mind to new ideas. So I started this study. Every time I'm around somebody that, that I look up to, a business hero, or just a person in life that I admire as an innovator uh, within a company, a government, wherever, I ask this question, what are they doing that everybody else isn't? And I started to wonder it because I have friends uh, that were really big innovators. Um, this is a Mike. Mike created this little idea. He was trying to share some pictures with friends. It was hard to do. So he innovated. He created something called Instagram. You might have heard of. Um, this uh, guy, Lars, was tired of getting lost all the time. So he started thinking about satellites and triangulation um, and your position on the earth. And this is the guy, my friend Lars created Google Maps, not Google. They actually acquired it from him uh, for like $1.1 billion. He was innovator in a better way for us to get around every day. Uh, this is my friend, Nolan. Uh, Nolan invented a little thing called video games. His company was called Atari. His first employees were Jobs and Wozniak. The way Nolan thinks every day, uh, it, it, it fascinated me. What do these people do that everybody else isn't, that they're so innovative? In fact, speaking of Woz, <coughs> it's been... Uh, when I became friends with Woz and heard the story of how Jobs and Wozniak created Apple and their innovations. And the answer is there is something, there's more than one something that these people do that everybody else doesn't. And that's the observations I want to share today. First of all, I want to start by saying this. When people talk about innovation, and I <clears> have <throat> been uh, called into major Fortune 500 global companies, where they said, help us innovate, conduct an innovation workshop for us. And what I see is when you tell people to innovate in any environment, at a university, at a company, at, at, at a government office, whatever, what people do 
is they look at their business and they say, how do we make it better, right? That is like being in the fast food industry and walking inside when someone says innovate and saying, is there, and staring at the, the French fry machine and saying, can we make French fries any faster? No, you can't heat up grease any more than that. It'll ruin the potatoes. Can we fill up Diet Cokes faster? No, they'll splatter. So they say, we got no ideas. We don't know how to innovate. When in fact, innovation comes outward. It comes from looking to see what the rest of the world is doing. And if maybe you could borrow an idea and I'll quickly share one of my favorite true stories of that. The reason I use that example, um, there was a hamburger chain in Ohio long ago uh, that the owner said, guys, we got to innovate. We just stopped growing. We haven't been opening more restaurants, uh, more, more uh, fast food burger joints. And part of his team looked inside and, and said what I just told you, we can't figure out a way to make burgers or fries or drinks faster, so we don't know what to do. But one of the people, true story, left and said, I'm gonna go see what banks are doing. And everybody else said, banks, that makes no sense. They don't serve French fries. And he said, just wanna see if I have an, they might have an idea uh, that we could use. Everybody else thought it was a waste of time. The fourth bank he went to, he couldn't park in the parking lot because in the parking lot, there were pickup trucks, piles of wood, hammer, nails, and carpenters. And he said, what are you guys doing? And they said, oh, we came up with a cool new idea for our bank. We're about to build it. He said, what's it going to be? They said, when we finish it, we're going to call it a drive through window. He zoomed back to his hamburger joint. The first drive through window in fast food history came from a bank, not a hamburger joint. No one in the industry thought of it. Somebody saw a bank doing it. That restaurant chain was acquired by Ray Kroc, became rolled into what became McDonald's because of their innovation for the drive through window, which they didn't even come up with. They came up with it by looking at banking. So that's what our theme is for today. And one of the things that we need to realize is that every night, this used to bother me, sleeping bothered me because every night while I go to sleep, somebody out there has innovated, created something new, and I missed it because I was sleeping. Every morning when you wake up, there is the possibility of a new piece of technology, a new trend, a new idea that someone else in the world created while you were sleeping, that if you could just get access, learn about that idea, you could be the first one in your industry to employ that idea, much like the hamburger chain took an idea from the banking industry. Um, so I want to share with you, here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to share with you three techniques, uh, things you can literally do tomorrow uh, to improve your odds of, of innovating and coming up with the next big idea. And I don't care if you're an entrepreneur, an academician, if you're, a, if you're in public service, or if you work in a major corporation, these things apply in all cases. So here's the first one. And I'm answering the question, what are the world's most innovative people and companies doing that everybody else isn't? Um, that's kind of what this leads to here. So um, that being said, um, this, uh, <laughs> this device, if you don't know what it is, is a five-year-old. Okay, everybody here has either been one or had one. Why do I pick a five-year-old? Because five is the age of why. Everything you say to a five-year-old, they say why. Get in the car, why? Because we have to go to the store, why? Uh, because we need food, why? Because we need to eat, why? Because we'll die if we don't eat, why? Everything you tell a five-year-old, they demand to know why, they accept nothing. And I wanna share this story with you. Um, and I have a TED talk out there that's called The Power of Wonder. It's about the power of childlike wonder. Uh, it's out there if you wanna watch it, but I'm gonna give it to you right now in summary form anyway. Um, so, uh, I was uh, well, I agreed to watch the five-year-old for the day. And what happened was um, I realized if I was going to stay home to babysit for a day, um, I left some stuff at the office that I needed to work at home. So I said to the five-year-old, I said, uh, go get in the car. We got to run up to the office. So we're walking to the car. She's walking very slowly and she's shuffling her feet. And I said, go get in the car already. We got to go. And she looked down, she looked back at me and she said, how do they make carpet? And I said, who cares how they make carpet? I have no idea. My company doesn't make carpet and at no point in my life will I ever need to know how to make carpet get in the car. And she said, well, just tell me how they make it. I said, I don't know how they make carpet. 
She said, you're an adult. I said, they don't teach you how to make carpet just because you become an adult. But she looked disgusted with me. So I was thinking, I'll give it my best shot. I remember literally a National Geographic um, special or something that I was watching uh, that they had looms and they weaved, went back and forth and they were weaving carpet. And I said to her, they use these big looms and they go back and forth and they make carpet. And she's like, yeah, right. And I was like, that's how they make carpet. Just get in the car. So she walks to the garage, walks up to the car. She taps on the window. I said, what? She said, how do they make glass? I said, I have no idea how they make glass. My company doesn't make glass. I don't even know. Just get in the car. And she said, well, I'm just really curious. How do you make glass? And I said, why does that matter? And she said, do you not know? I said, I don't. And she said, now this is funny today. She said, I thought you went to Yale. I said, I didn't take glass at Yale. And she said, just tell me. And I said, geez, I'm thinking, what do I got here? In eighth grade, we went to a glass blowing factory. And I'm sorry, but that's all I got. I said, I think it's like these big furnaces and they heat it up and it gets red hot and they throw sand in there and it melts in the glass. And she's like, sure it does. And I said, just get in the car already. Before she gets in, oops, you see the, uh, the, the part, the strip that goes up between the front window and the back, the passenger window there, right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about. The strip between the two windows. She said, what is this thing called? I said, it doesn't have a name. It's just the thing between the two windows. And she said, well, what do they call it? I said, they don't call it anything. It doesn't have a name. And she said, I can't believe you don't seem to know anything. And I said, just get in the car already. Well, I got to tell you, she turns around, she puts her little hands on her hips. And she says, if this thing doesn't have a name, how do they order more of those on an assembly line? So I gave this talk in Detroit once and everyone in the audience raised their hand. And they said, it also, it has a part number and a SKU number. That thing between the windows is called a B pole. She was right, I was wrong. It has a SKU number and it has a part number and it has a name. We get to the office, we walk in the office and it doesn't stop. She turns around, in the office there's a table in the front with these two machines on it. And she said, what is that? Why do you have two of those? I was like, I just go already. And she's pointing at everything. Why do you guys print that stuff? Why is that person on the phone? I finally bribed her with a bag of chips, got her in the conference room, and I went and sat down in my office. And I was exasperated. And I was thinking something. I'm upset, but I'm not mad at the five-year-old. I'm upset that I own the company and I can't answer any of these questions. So I go get my office manager. And I said to her, I said, what are, I, I, I've called over, and there's two machines in the lobby. I walk by them every single day. I said, what is that machine in our lobby and why do we have two? She said, I don't know. They've been here since you hired me. I said, but you're the office manager. She said, you're the owner. You don't even know what they are. I said, go find out. She came back and said, no one has any idea what those machines are. I said, no one here knows what they are and they're in our lobby and every employee walks past them every day. And she said, yep. So I called my CFO. I said, go figure out what those are. He comes back 30 minutes later. He said, boss, I got good news and bad news. And I said, what? And he said, the good news is I figured out what those machines are. And I said, what are those machines? He said, turns out in the days before PowerPoint, we used to bind presentations, if you guys remember. He said, those are spiral binders that, that from the days before PowerPoint, that's what they're for. And I said, what's the bad news? And he said, yeah, Jeff, we're leasing those. Um, I just stood there and I thought, oh my God, what else do we not see in our lives because we are so, our surroundings are so familiar and we stop looking at, we stop questioning everything. And so that caused me to launch something that I will challenge you to do. You need to start again. Here's the difference. Kids wonder about everything naturally. That's what they do for a living. Adults stop wondering. We stop seeing the world around us. It's so invisible. In fact, I got so hung up on this that I had given an employee a ride to work that lived near me and I asked him to drive home. And he said, you want me to drive you home in your car? He lived right near me. I said, yeah, because I was curious about our la what we've stopped noticing when the world becomes too routine and too familiar to us. And so as we drove home, I spotted, uh, I said, whoa, I can't believe they opened a Petco 
right near where I live. I've been driving across town. I'm glad that new store is open. And he started laughing and I said, what? He said, that Petco has been there for a year. I said, you gotta be kidding. And I started to wonder if you sat in the passenger seat of your own life, what would you see that you would never see while you're driving the same routine and the same routes every day? That's what we're doing in our business. We don't ask questions anymore. We don't see anything that's familiar. I didn't even see those machines in my lobby. Here is a solution. I challenge you to try. I called all my employees in. I said, Friday is five-year-old day. We then did this. We do it twice a year at our companies. We hold five-year-old day. On five-year-old day, everybody comes into the office and behaves like a five-year-old. We questioned everything we do, every process, every piece of equipment, every decision, every job description. We say why, why, and why, and we do it with intent. If we can't answer why we're doing something, I will tell you something. When we were done with the first five-year-old day, I think we streamlined operations 40% because when we couldn't get to the end of why, there were things that nobody knew why we were doing that anymore. It's just we've always done it that way and no one ever stopped to ask because it became so routine and familiar. When we played five-year-old, and if you can't act like one, bring one into the office. Let a five-year-old wander around and ask you questions about how you run your business. You will find so many things that you don't really know the answer to anymore because it made sense three years ago when you first implemented that. So that's the first technique. You need to recover your sense of childlike wonder, but you need to do it with intent. You need to literally schedule time where you say, let's stop and question everything we do and everything we have and why we do it that way. We do five-year-old day twice a year. I want to tell you, when I left, I got back and I was like, you know what, after five-year-old day, okay, how do they make glass? And I thought, what if I just went like the fast food guy going to the bank and did a little research and I just want to show you where that led. So I started researching glass just because I was never going to expand my knowledge base if I only stuck to my industry. Like the five-year-old wonders how they make glass, but you don't because you don't need to know it. And the key to innovation is learning things you don't need to know and seeing if you can synthesize new ideas there. So I started studying glass. The first glass company I thought of was Corning. I went to their website. Corning makes coffee pots, right, and saucepans. Did you expect their lobby to look like this? Okay, uh, Corning invited me out to visit and showed me their innovation center. When I started studying how they make glass, I, they, they said, we wanna show you what we're working on. They're working on smart glass. They showed me a demo of the next generation of shopping. You can imagine where this took me being an online retailer. The next generation of shopping though, these women, this is a, an actual demo. These women are window shopping, but when they see something in the window, she touches the window, points at an object, and a 3D holographic image of the jacket that's on the mannequin floats over to the window. She can take her fingers and spin it around. And here's another amazing thing. Guess what else is on your finger? Your fingerprint. When she touches the window, it reads her fingerprint, and down below there, it pulled up her, her social media and it's showing all of her friends that bought the same jacket and the comments they made about the jacket on Facebook. It's instantly telling her from her fingerprint on the window who else she knows that shops there, what they bought and what they liked. It also knows that she has a pair of gloves she bought there recently that would go with that hat. The window is trying to close the sale smart glass is coming. And when I saw that, that led me to the next rabbit hole. Wait a minute, holograms. So I thought I'm gonna do the five-year-old thing. How do they make holograms? So I went and researched a, a huge effort that in this case, I looked at Microsoft's product HoloLens. Never even heard of that. They're spending billions on holographic technology. That discovery of holograms led some friends of mine in the music industry to say, whoa, wait, holograms, we could do something really cool with that. Some of you might have heard of this. Some friends of mine held a concert of a dead rapper named Tupac Shakur. They brought him back to life holographically and they did a sold out concert of him performing many years after he passed away using hologram technology. 
all that path occurred because I was wondering, how do they make glass? And I followed that path. That's where innovation comes from. Let's move on to the second technique. The world's best innovators harvest ideas. And let's see, let me tell you what I mean by that. Most of us, let's say that you're in healthcare. What is it you do every day? Healthcare, that's what you're working on all day. If I asked you to go with me to a banking industry conference, you would say, Jeff, we're in healthcare. I don't really care what banks do. If I gave you a magazine called uh, Managing a Retail Mall, you'd be like, really, Jeff, we're in healthcare. I don't care. Therein lies the missed opportunity. We spend all our time working in our industry. But here's what I noticed about those innovators, those most innovative people. They schedule time to go see what the rest of the world is doing. And so I came up with a technique I want to share with you. I made up this word. I just call it info sponging. But I came up with a technique to emulate what these people do. And, and it's my version of practice. Derek Jeter swings a bat. I exercise my brain by doing this. And so here's what info sponging is. Every single day for the first 10 minutes of the day, 15 minutes of the day, if you can't do this daily, do it once a week, do it every other day. But I try to do this every day. For the first 15 minutes of the day, let's say, you do not work for your company and you are not in the healthcare industry. You are going to leave your company, you're going to leave your industry, and here's what you're going to do. You are going to learn one new thing a day, but here's the challenge. It's one new thing you don't need to know. It's literally, okay, how do they make glass? Even though my company doesn't make glass and I'll probably never make glass, that's what I'm going to do today. Info sponge, by the way, people always ask me, where do you go to find your info sponge? And I'm going to tell you, just follow your curiosity. Don't overthink it. And sometimes when you follow your gut, if something, if an article appeals to me, I just click on it. I don't spend a second wondering why that caught my eye. And the reason for that is I think that your gut instinct um, needs to hire a new marketing manager. Uh, because when you, when I tell people, just follow your gut, right? When something catches your eye, read it. People feel like gut instinct is this irresponsible, you know, irrational decision making. The truth is your gut instinct needs to rebrand itself and call it your super fast intelligence. Because when something catches my eye, my gut is the sum total of every mistake I've ever made and everything I've ever done right. So when my gut instinct says, woo, I wonder what that shiny object is, I reach down and pick it up. Um, your gut knows what it is doing. Follow your curiosity. So every day I learn one new thing I don't need to know. And I write down a one sentence description of what I learned. And here's what I want you to think of. Every new piece of knowledge you acquire, think of it like a puzzle piece. Um, but here's the thing. If I gave Tony a piece of a puzzle and said, Tony, what's this? He'd be like, Jeff, how would I know? You gave me one puzzle piece, it's blue. If I gave him two or three, he still wouldn't know. But what if every day Tony acquired another piece of the puzzle, put all the pieces on his desk, and each time he got a new one, he shuffled them all around? What would happen eventually is Tony would say to me, Jeff, I know what this is. I can see what these pieces are forming together. This puzzle is going to be a castle, right, in Ireland. That is what the world's most innovative people do with knowledge. They continue to acquire different puzzle pieces every day. They mix them around. I always think about it like refrigerator magnets that my mom had on the fridge. There were bunches of words, and every time I'd walk up to the fridge, I'd move them all around to see if I can make a new sentence. The world's most brilliant innovators do that to synthesize ideas. So I write down one sentence of what I learned today. Most days, oh, I look you at need it to finish your opium. And most days I look at it and I'm like, yeah, I don't know what that means. But let me give you an example of how that works. So um, this is a guy, Travis, that was telling me that one day, now he didn't use my term, info sponging, but one day Travis was reading about the sharing economy which he knew nothing about at that time. What is the sharing economy? What does it mean? What does it do? And he made a note that the sharing economy is people that have access to resources that other people might need, would like to find a way to share them. Okay, not sure what that is. In one of his other info sponging days, he read a story about task-based freelance work. 
And what it said was, some people don't want a job, they want an assignment. Give me something to do right now and pay for me, pay me for it, but I don't want a job. I just want a work assignment for now. And so he said, that's an interesting thing. There's technology to do task-based freelance work. I wonder what that means. Two puzzle pieces. Then one day he read a story about something called micropayments. The fact that people can use an app now to pay each other small amounts of money and no one has to take cash or the old way of managing money. There's an interesting puzzle piece. Then one day he read a puzzle piece about in a, da in a tough economy, people want a side hustle. What does a side hustle mean? People wish they could make a few extra bucks on the way to work or after work, not just at their job. There's a puzzle piece. And then at the end, he was reading about increasing pollution caused by increasing traffic congestion. You know what Travis did? He took all these puzzle pieces and he put them in, together in a way no one else had ever thought of. His idea was Uber. And what Travis, think about this guys, if you invented and innovated the old way and somebody said to you, innovate the future of taxis, you, the, what is the first thing you would have done if you told your friends you were gonna start a new taxi company? You would have gone and bought taxis. You would have got cars. That's the old model of innovation. If you were collecting pieces of knowledge from around the world and saying, can I arrange these puzzle pieces in a way no one else has thought of, you would have created the world's largest taxi company that doesn't own one single car. This innovation would not have come from the transportation industry. It came from an effect info sponging. That's my challenge to you every single day. By the way, that is what happened there in Connecticut uh, at the startup I was part of, Priceline. Um, Priceline came uh, from an inventor there in Connecticut, uh, Jay Walker, who had collected different pieces of intellectual property. And those things included um, a reverse auction, distressed inventory, perishable commodities, all these ideas that what we were saying was, wait, what if we created a distressed inventory, perishable commodity, reverse auction distribution system? That's what this company is today. And this is a company started on a table in Stanford, Connecticut that grew into, you may know it as this now, that's the same parent company, but it's a $90 billion company today. And it was started by recombining ideas uh, that nobody had ever thought of using that way before. So my challenge to you is try this. Try adopt an info sponging habit every day. Learn one new thing a day. 10 minutes is all I'm asking you to give. It's not in your industry that you don't need to know and see where that takes you in the same way like I told you that when I finally did go look up how do they make glass, I wound up in the innovation lab at Corning studying start, smart glass and holography. I would have never gotten there. Now we're looking at ways of, to adapt to those technologies in the brand new industries. I'll go into the third and final one now. I mentioned that innovation typically is done by looking inward and that's where I think the missed opportunity is. That's good. Um, and the, the, let, let's just go back to our healthcare example. You're in the healthcare industry and you guys want to innovate. If you are staring at your company and you've been there in it for 20 years, you are going to slightly modify everything you can and you are going to create healthcare 21.0. The problem with healthcare 21.0 is that you are dragging along every bad decision you've ever made. Every paradigm, old paradigm, every legacy system. When you stare at an existing business and say, let's innovate and move things forward, you, you create you know, healthcare 21.0 and you move this big thing a little bit forward. Here's an alternative that I'm gonna suggest. Um, we do something called Blue Sky Sessions. And what I do is I call my whole team in we usually only do this once a year. Call everybody into the room. And it, by the way, totally inclusive. We invite the receptionist. There's nobody whose ideas don't have value, but it's not mandatory. If you don't want to participate, don't, although everybody always comes when we do these. I do these for other companies now. In a blue sky session, this is the question that I ask that I challenge you to ask. If we were going to start our entire industry or company over from scratch today, 
How would you do it? Let's do that. And I hand everybody a marker and say, let's start our company all over from scratch today or our industry. You know, I had an interesting thing this morning. I was thinking about it because I had a, an interesting moment uh, while I was at Yale. Um, I was studying programming. And as I told you guys, I was in computer science. And back then, Fortran was a language. And I submitted a recommendation uh, to the university uh, back then. And I said, in addition to Latin, German, or French, I propose that we make Fortran an acceptable language requirement at Yale. Well, I was joking, but it got brought up before the university council. And it caused a debate. We had a town hall about literally the liberal arts, liberal arts value of studying Latin versus the practical value of studying Fortran. And partway through it, Bart Giamatti called me up and he said, can I ask you something? And I said, what, we're having a town hall with professors and all these people. And he said, I just thought just occurred to me. And I said, what? And he said, were you serious? And I said, no, sir, I was joking. And he said, okay, promise me you'll never tell anybody that because this is an amazing debate we have going on. And I didn't realize you sent that to me as a joke. Um, but it made me think. Today I was thinking, if you reinvented Yale today, took out a clean sheet of paper and said, how would we create this university today from a mission statement? What would it look like? Because it probably wouldn't look like the university or the educational system we know now. So the idea is to reinvent your company. Um, first of all, it's a fun exercise. It's fascinating. But here's a couple of things before I close up. Um, when you do this, what you're going to invent when you redesign your business from scratch today or your industry, you're going to create something because when you started, you didn't know about social media. You didn't know about mobile phones and purchasing. You didn't know about any of these things that we, you, you didn't even know about Zoom back then. So if you started over and redesigned your school or your industry, you would design it with all those things in mind instead of trying to ram them into an old existing paradigm. Now, admittedly, the thing you're going to design up here can't be implemented because what I tell my people when we do this is no constraints and no budgets. I tell them no gravity. There's literally no gravity, just free think. Well, then if you create something where you don't think about budget, you don't even think about reality, you're going to design something you can't build. But what I'm telling you is if you take this pie in the sky, really cool new idea, and you start bringing it slowly down towards reality, you will end at a point that is way farther ahead than you would have been if you started with all the old stuff and just tried to slightly push it forward. So I'm gonna give you an example of how we do these, what no gravity means. Um, and so what you wanna do is you wanna get everybody in the room. There's no org chart and no ego allowed in the room because in a company setting, university, any setting, People are, if people are afraid to suggest something because their boss is in the room and might think they're criticizing the way they do it, you might as well give up. Your, your, your organization will not be an innovative leader. Innovation comes from checking org chart at the door, no ego in the room, and you just let it fly. What happens when you do that is, I'll be honest, 99 out of 100 ideas are crazy. And I used to tell my people, no, in fact, we're not laughing with you. We are laughing at you, but it's okay because you're going to laugh at me next. And what happens is 99 out of 100 ideas are unrealistic, but because you're wide open thinking with no filters and no gravity, the 100th idea is literally brilliant to that we record these because somebody says, wait, what? Everyone in the room says, what did you just say? And the person that says it always goes, I don't know, man, I was just letting it fly. And we play back the recording and we say, oh my God, that is the most brilliant idea ever. You will never hear that idea if you are editing your ideas based on budget and legacy systems and everything. So here's a real example of what Blue Sky looks like. One day we were doing a Blue Sky session and we were innovating um, the fast food. In well, we weren't. We were getting ready to start a Blue Sky session to reinvent an industry and rethink it from scratch and one of my key people was late. And when he got there, I said, why are you late? And he said, oh, by the way, a part of, the, part, of, part of this is make it all inclusive, but I already mentioned that. Who's in the room for a blue sky? Everybody. So I said, why are you late? And he said, because I was stuck in the fast food line. And that's a real picture uh, from, from where he was. 
And he said, fast food's just not fast. I wish we could make it quicker. That's why I was late. I said, all right, let's innovate that today. Let's think about how we could do that. So here's what we did not do. We did not go inside a McDonald's and stare at the hamburgers and the French fry machine and say, how do we do the old way better? What we did was we said, no gravity. What do you want to do? You know what the guy said to me? He started, he suddenly he said, Jeff, I was at a concert recently. And he said, when I went to the concert, um, he said, you know, at concerts or sporting events, they give out t-shirts. I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure where this is going, um, but this is how we do Blue Sky. And he said, well, you know, they give you concerts. He said, they, they use these t-shirt cannons and they fire t-shirts up into the crowd. I'm like, right, I'm listening, uh, let, you know, go on. And he said, here's my idea, my Blue Sky, no gravity idea. He said, I am going, I'm never gonna stop at McDonald's again. I am going to text them my order voice text while I'm driving. And then when I drive by, he said, they are going to, uh, uh, I'm gonna unroll my window and as I drive by, McDonald's employees are gonna be standing on the curb with lunch cannons. They're going to be firing cheeseburgers into people's cars as they drive by. That is the starting point. We all laughed and said, obviously we can't do that. But we started there and we said, well, what could we do to make it as close to firing lunch into a cannon. And we started in, from there working down instead of from where we were working up. And what we came up with was something that we actually launched a new company. And let me just quickly tell you it and then I'll end. So we have a little bit of time if anyone can want to do any Q and A. Um, we wound up launching a new company that day. And what we did was we put an intelligent electric eye in the parking lot and the eye is reading license plates and the eye what companies like McDonald told us is, this is their term, that the bulk of their revenue comes from soccer moms. And that just means people, not, not literally necessarily moms. It's the same people that come, the soccer mom comes every Tuesday and Thursday with her son and her daughter, and they get the same thing every time. And in the morning, if you stop by a McDonald's or a Dunkin' Donuts, it's the same people every day getting mostly the same order at the same time on their way to work. Their, work, their customers are very patterned. So the electric eye watches people come up because the first thing that slows you down is stopping, welcome to McDonald's, may I take your order? You know what you wanna do? You, you, what you're saying to yourself, the soccer mom, yes, how about it's the same order every Tuesday and every Thursday, why do you guys never recognize me? And so what we did was the electric eye reads the license plate, figures out that that's Wendy, and immediately tells the people, Wendy's pulling into the parking lot. We know what her kids like based on history. Just start prepping the order. So now we've, we're one step closer to the don't stop cannon because you don't stop an order anymore. And then we got to a second part. If the other thing that slows you down is paying. So we say to Wendy, when she pulls in, look, you're here every Tuesday and Thursday. If you want, you don't have to pay anymore. Just swipe your card one time and every month, we'll bill you for all your McDonald's purchases. And she said, sure. So now you don't stop to order and you don't stop to pay. And we said, while we're at it, here's an idea. If you come so, so consistently anyway, what if we sign you up for a Happy Meal subscription? You can buy a month's worth of your children's food in advance. They're normally $2.39. We'll give them to you for a buck 79. You get a discount. McDonald's got an entire month's worth of money before they made any food. They make money on the money. That's how they can afford the discount. She says, sure. So you know what? We're literally took it, wound up testing at fast food restaurants in the Northeastern United States. We were testing a brand new lane, the express lane. In the express lane, you literally don't stop to order. You don't stop to pay. You just slow down a little bit and somebody is holding a bag out the window. And that is as close as we could get, but that's a lot closer to firing lunch in a cannon than the way it works now. All that idea, ideation and innovation came from a guy saying, let's fire lunch in a cannon. So to summarize that, read, try this once a year, reinvent your business, take a clean sheet, no budgets, no constraints, and reinvent your company, your industry from scratch, and then pick the brilliant ideas out of that and bring them back to reality. So I'm gonna close by saying, 
every day while you sleep, someone else in the world in some other industry came up with something really cool. You need to be the first person in your industry to synthesize other ideas into new solutions in your industry the same way that Uber did in their industry or Airbnb in the hotel industry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and last, I gave you three techniques. Try a five-year-old day. Schedule time to intentionally question everything you do and why you do it that way and everything you have. And you will be amazed. Again, we do five-year-old day twice a year. Next, I told you about info sponging. Try this routine of, of, of every day learning one new thing a day or as frequently as you can that you don't need to know so that you can collect puzzle pieces of knowledge about the world around you and rearrange them in a way no one else ever has. And last, we talked about blue sky sessions, which is having calling your whole team in and saying, let's start Yale over today with everything we know, draw it and see what you come up with because you will come up with ideas you'll never come up with if you're only staring at 300 years worth of history and saying, can we make some slight modification to the way we've always done things? Thank you guys so much for having me today, uh, for spending this time with me and I'll turn it back over. Um, I don't know, Eddie, if it's you or Marie or if we have uh, time to take any questions. Yeah, I mean, I'll ha I'm happy to, thank you so much, Jeff. I'm, I'm happy to manage the questions. So uh, we have- If time people have for, questions that they want yeah. to put in the chat. Yeah, or, or raise your hand, uh, happy to call on you. And if there's not any questions, I know people have classes to get to, et cetera. Yeah, that's fine as well. I just uh, appreciate the opportunity to share this with you guys today. Wait, I, I think Rick, uh, Rick Taft, do you wanna unmute yourself? Uh, there I unmuted, so I guess you can hear me. I, I, I just uh, offer a personal uh, note of gratitude to hear the five-year-old day uh, advocated as an occasional <clears throat> um, method of, of uh, fostering good innovation, but I would, I would suggest that you consider uh, doing what I do, which is to do it every day. I, I absolutely would prefer that. I was trying to ease people into it, Rick, but I completely agree with you. And, and that was kind of part of the focus of, of, of when I gave the TED talk. If people would regain their sense of childlike wonder, an entire new worlds would open up to them. And we as adults don't do that. We get we get two uh, you know blinders on and narrow focus. So I completely agree with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing the comment. You're welcome. I enjoyed uh, your talk very much. Thank you. I, I say, uh, uh, Kiko has a question. Would you like to go ahead? I can answer that. I see Kiko's question yeah. in the chat about blue ocean strategy, yeah. and and yes, I am uh, uh, definitely a fan as well. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have read that, but yeah, that is one more uh, technique that, that I do definitely believe in and subscribe to. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. And Jeff, I assume you're familiar with the, uh, um, the, five, the, the five whys or the, the, the why approach in the Japanese quality uh, control literature. You know, the way to do continuous improvement is to always ask why to get to root cause of problems. Absolutely. And, you know, not only have I uh, studied that uh, significantly, <laughs> but the, the Japanese way many years ago saved me because I got yelled at by everybody in the world, starting with my mom, for being the world's biggest procrastinator. And then the Japanese came up with something called JIT, just in time. And all of a sudden, I was an innovator. Overnight, I went from being a procrastinator to an innovator. <laughs> because I was doing just in time all along. I just got accused of procrastinating. Then the Japanese said just in time manufacturing is the most efficient way to deliver anything. <laughs> so I've always been a fan of, of some of those ideas, but yes, I agree with that as well. By the way, Chuck uh, put in the, uh, in the chat, because now I got myself off on a tangent when I was thinking this morning about what if a whole group of us just decided to re reinvent Yale just to see 
what it, we might come up with. So I just want to say, if you guys do that, don't forget to invite me because I'll come up to New Haven for that. <laughs> I would just love to have the intellectual exercise of rethinking our model. Anyway. There's a question from Gerard um, and uh, follow up from Chuck, I think. Oh, so Gerard, I'll read it. So Gerard's talking about behind me is sort of the wall of things that I believe in um, and sort of what drives me. I'll lift that up a little bit. I keep them there where I can see them. And one of the things on the wall uh, says, because it was on my door during all my CEO years, all the years I was a CEO, it said on my door, ideas are welcome here, but execution is worshiped. Um, because, and part of what it says up there is you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, just the hardest working. And the reason is I spend my whole life getting pitched. People are pitching me ideas and almost nobody ever executes anything. And some of the most successful people in the world were absolutely not smarter than you. They were simply the people that executed, right? And too many people spend too much time trying to perfect an idea when the truth is your idea won't get improved or iterated until you launch it anyway. So pick up a shovel and start digging, even if you're not sure what direction the path is going. That's why that's up there. So uh, his question was, he said, any ideas for uh, tips on executing? And yeah, that's the, that's the main one is take your best guess, document your assumptions, make a list of the questions you wish you knew the answer to, and then jump. And then literally uh, start, because once you enter the world, as soon as you're outdoors digging, that's when people walk up and say, you know, there's a power line right there. I would go left if I were you, right? And someone else walks up and says, you know, there's rocks there. You should dig a little bit deeper right there. The world jumps in only when you begin actually building an idea, not when you're sitting at a whiteboard and talking about it. Jeff, where do you see uh, values coming in in this process? Um, I think values are everything. In fact, when I talk about, one of the things I talk about frequently is that uh, when you ask, when people talk about startups and small businesses and they say, what, what do you need to grow? They always, the, the, the fun answer, the popular answer is funding. But the truth is financial capital, money is not the scarcest resource in the world, talent is, right? Human capital is way harder to find than financial capital. I can find a lot of people that write you a check. I can find extremely few rock stars that I can build my company around. You can't build greatness on the backs of mediocre. So you got to find rock stars out there and those are hard to find. And what draws those people is not a paycheck, but what draws them is a culture that they want to be in a culture that cares about impact, that cares about experience, that cares about values. So I always tell, make it clear, we hire, we've never hired by resumes at all. In fact, on the cross campus system, I've had a few Yale students reach out to me recently and saying, um, what do I have to do? Uh, to, as they've asked me, what do I have to do to come work for you? And the answer isn't, what do I have to do? The question should be, who do I have to be to come work for you? because I don't care anything near. I can teach you skills. That's what's on your resume, but I can't rewrite your DNA. And so what we focus on is do we have shared values in the world? And our business is a vehicle to deliver our values. It's not just a place. We don't just go to work every day trying to make money. In fact, the reason we're trying to make money, and I think it says that behind me too, your success is someone else's miracle. And I wrote that down the day that we built a profitable business and we found out that we were able to build shelters for abused women. We were able to fund homes for, uh, for domestic abuse victims and a place to give women to live that had nowhere to live. Turns out that cost money. And it turns out the only reason that I had that money to help those women is because I was really good at business and our business was profitable, which only happened because we had the best people which only happened because we led with our values, not with our spreadsheets. There's a question from uh, Kamala um, asking about innovation cycles and how to, how to get people to make the investment in the innovation process. Um, I think that the key 
um, is that uh, bite-sized chunks is my answer to the question. Um, if you look at, I'll give you an example that if I asked you to name innovative companies, you would all name Apple and Google and Tesla or whatever. Um, probably none of you would have listed Whirlpool that makes uh, appliances and washers and dryers, and you would have missed one of the most innovative companies in the world. Like 85% of all innovations in small electronics and, and their field have come from that company. And you know why? Because they do bite-sized chunks. What they do is they do an experiment, they do a process where they seed little experiments. An employee comes and says, I got an idea. And what they do there, I love this program, is they say, tell you what, we're gonna ask your coworkers to cover for you for six weeks. We want you to go over to the innovation lab at work. We're gonna give you six weeks and 7,500 bucks to prove the feasibility of your concept. If at the end of six weeks, and $7,500, it's a little investment in time and it's just a tiny bit of money. If you can convince us that your new idea is a good one, we'll put it into the product cycle and you may be working on it. If not, we're going to thank you for trying, send you back to work and bring us your next good idea. By the way, their employees don't complain about covering for Marie while she's gone for six weeks. They cheer her on. They say, go Marie, go, because next time she might be covering for them, but their culture is one that understands that if she wins, we all win because we all work for the same company. So bite-sized chunks and seeding experiments is my answer to your question. Too many people look at it as a big giant uh, cost to bite off and that's not the way to look at it. Another question from uh, in the chat from uh, Anne about, it's almost like a failure question. Like, did you ever have you know, a team of people that didn't really get the innovation thinking that you wanted? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, uh, less inside my company, because we have a sort of policy, you know, I fundamentally believe in the inverted pyramid. Um, my employees don't work for me as a CEO. Um, I work for them. Success comes when you surround yourself with people smarter than you and then spend the rest of your time taking care of them so they never wanna leave. So I don't really run the companies. I find people smarter than me and I build an environment that they feel valued, respected, right, appreciated and they feel like they're growing in. My job is to make sure that people smarter than me come to my company and then never leave. So as a result, one of the things we do- By the way, that's, that's how Yale is structured, hopefully. Hopefully, indeed, um, that's the right way to do it. Um, the uh, I uh, so therefore, I hire hard and I manage easy. So the reason I'm saying that is it didn't tend to be my internal teams that didn't get innovation because I put so much time into choosing people before I hire them that those kind of people don't usually make it onto our team. As a matter of fact, if you had a budget of X, I would tell you to spend it on six to overspend on six rock stars instead of hiring 15 average people. The conventional wisdom is hire as many people as you can with this money, it's wrong. The better wisdom is take all that money instead of getting 15 average people, hire six rock stars and overpay them and you will far outperform the average companies. I learned that only by doing it. So we don't have that problem internally, but you bet we've had that failure with customers that have come to us and we're like, your DNA, you're talking about innovation, but you don't have the DNA. I had an example of a, C of a CEO who said, we wanna innovate, teach us how. And I said, do you? He said, yep. I said, are you actually, do you have the DNA of innovation in your company? He said, absolutely. As the CEO, I preach that and our people are open to ideas. I said, you guys will get a kick out of this. I said, come with me, we're gonna do a little role play. So I took the guy, the CEO of the company, and I made him hide in his own company down the hall. I went into the engineering department and I got an engineer and I did a little role playing. I took the engineering, engineer down to marketing and, and I, I promise I'll make this quick. And I had him walk into marketing with the CEO hiding behind the wall and say to the marketing department, I have a brilliant idea that I think is going to save our company millions of dollars, but it has to do with marketing and I need to sit down with somebody. You know what they said? Why don't you go back to product engineering where you belong and don't tell us how to do our job? 
He said, no, no, this will save the company millions. And they said, but it's a marketing idea, which is not your business and not your job. Do we tell you how to build products? No. So why don't you get out of our department with the CEO right there? I said, really? You have the DNA of innovation? <laughs> why? Because people react to what you grade them on. Those employees are graded only on the results of the marketing department. Product is graded only and paid only by the results of marketing. So the structure of your company, Eddie, is what caused some of these companies to fail. They said, we want to do innovation, but no employees were incented to innovate. They were incented to, quote, make their numbers and only their numbers because their family, you can't blame them, their family's future and ability to pay their mortgage depends on their compensation, which is geared around them doing their job. They don't want somebody else's idea. So the failure came from the companies that were not structured in any way to reward people that take risks and come up with new ideas. Thank you. You have time for any more questions? I don't know if we have time for one more or not. I just want to respect people's time because we're at the top of the hour. So you tell me. Uh, yeah, how about one more? I think there's something from uh, Chuck, Chuck Wellers asking about Jen, G-E-N. Yeah, Jen is our organization, the Global Entrepreneurship Network, uh, which is what I spend most of my time of. Um, and I'm the chair of, we fundamentally believe uh, that entrepreneurs are the people that will solve the greatest problems of our generation. Um, we need everybody else involved, right? From our educational system to our governments, uh, to the rest of the private sector. Um, but we believe that entrepreneurs are the ones that are gonna solve the world's biggest problems because unlike larger institutions, they don't have to follow all the rules. Uh, they're not sort of, you know, they don't have the same level of red tape. They live in a world where they seek forgiveness and not permission. They're efficient and agile that larger organizations are not. So we work with entrepreneurs all over the world to help them address the world's biggest problems in the most efficient way that they can. Um, so that's what the organization does. We tested the innovation, uh, but I'll just give you a quick example uh, to Chuck's question. We held, uh, you know what Shark Tank is, we decided to do a truly global pitch competition so we held this year the Entrepreneurship World Cup, and we had 175,000 entrepreneurs from 200 countries submit innovations and ideas. We had to hold uh, competitions, elimination rounds for their ideas in 100 different countries. We eventually picked 100 best, and then I brought, uh, if those of you do watch Shark Tank, uh, Kevin O'Leary, who plays Mr. Wonderful in Shark Tank, he and I, uh, uh, along with, we invited the uh, Crown Prince of Saudi because the royal family uh, put up a lot of money for this. This was an expensive venture. But the three of us judged the finals uh, to pick the winners. And then we funded them. We gave out millions of dollars in cash because these are the people you want to win. The winner uh, was, first of all, a female-led tech company, which I love because we're trying to inspire more girls in STEM and women in tech and women as CEOs. So a relatively young uh, Asian female entrepreneur won. And her invention is that she has, she was saw a research statistic that milk is a bitter, bigger product than meat in the world. More people need and consume milk than meat. And she was blown away by that. And then she did the research and discovered the health effects of milk for children and babies. Then she discovered the percentage of the world that can't get milk because there's either no cows where they live or there's no refrigeration. And so she created a process where she creates milk from cells with no cows and no refrigerators. She is producing milk without any animals and she's producing it without any refrigeration. And it's been validated by scientists all over and we were blown away by her invention. I, I'm now mentoring her and it's incredible what any one young innovator, and it only takes one, right? For those of you who are professors or teachers, uh, any one student you encounter might be the one that changes the world tomorrow. That's why I love that Mother Teresa quote, if you can't feed 100 people, then feed one, right? Do something, help somebody, because that one might have been the difference maker. And for those of you who are entrepreneurs, any one of you uh, might be the next 
uh, person that comes up. Any morning you wake up is a morning that a new idea might come up from while you were sleeping that you'll say, wow, I just got an idea. And you run to the lab and you figure out how to make milk without a cow. Um, so that's why we created, Gen is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we created it to make sure that the, these innovators um, have the ecosystem that they need to actually turn their ideas into companies. So I, I think that's probably a good yeah. one to go. Yeah, that's, thank you. That was, that was great to hear more about it um, and uh, take that time for that. So thank, thank you, Jeff. I know, we're, I think we're out of time here. People are kind of fading out. So uh, thank you guys very much yeah. for uh, spending the time today. I am just, wait, I'll type it in there. Um, I'm just typing in my email address for any questions that I didn't uh, get to. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your time today. And thanks, Testo M, for having me. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Bye -bye. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.